I had become fascinated with India, really from movies, um, particularly the movies of Satyajit Ray, the filmmaker right, Satyajit right. Ray. Ray is one of my masters. He's one of the filmmakers whose work I return to. I keep his films with me all the time. And when I want to be focused again, I go back to them. What interests me is density. How much can you tell? How telling can you make your images? I like simple themes, simple emotional situations, and I think simple things are more universal than complex ones. It's all a matter of telling the story in the best possible way. Let's go. I was born in a place called Garpar Road, in a printing press, actually. In fact, it was a huge building which housed the printing and block making department, which my grandfather had started. And I spent the first six years of my life in that place. I remember songs and singing a great deal, because my mother used to sing very well. Sketching, painting, drawing, I had it at the back of my mind while I was in college or even late school that I would be a professional artist doing perhaps some kind of commercial art. The cinema came of course much later. We were exposed to both Western and Eastern culture at the same time. I used to read the comics and everything so I grew up in that kind of atmosphere where both uh, Western sort of influences and the normal in indigenous influences worked. I think in my early school days, I, my main interest was stars. I was really a film fan. And I used to read magazines like Photoplay and Film Pictorial and things like that. But then, gradually, I think early years in college, I became more and more interested in the directorial aspect of filmmaking. I became aware of the director. And I was reading up on people like John Ford, Ernst Lubitsch, William Wyler, Frank Capra and looking for their speciality in a film, their, their sort of special characteristics. They were very, very well-crafted films, so my education really is based on these extremely well-written, well-directed, well-shot, well-acted films of the 30s and 40s. Mr. Jean Renoir, the French director, in 49, I think, he came to Calcutta to look for locations for the river. I was an advertising man at that time, and it so happened that the agency where I worked was quite near the hotel where it was staying. So I just went and presented myself as a student of the cinema, and uh, I got to know him quite well because he was comparatively free at that time in the evenings, and I would often sort of drop in, and that was very, very important for me. The talks that I had with him, even before I had seen his French films. Renoir told me, why don't you make a film if you're so interested? Uh why don't you give up what you're doing and go into filmmaking? I said, well, I have an idea to make this kind of a film, and I described the story. He said, do it. It sounds marvelous. This was uh, on his first visit. It was only after I decided on Patir Pachali, after reading the book when I illustrated it, that the idea of turning that into a film and directing myself occurred to me. So mm, that was that. So I am a product of both East and West, almost equally. <laughs> but as a filmmaker, my roots are deep in India. The first film had no proper script because I, the film was made while I still had my advertising job. And it was all in my head. It was shot on weekends, frankly speaking, over a period of two years. Two years because for long stretches we had no money. 
I had to be very economical. Then I decided that I will make this film with amateurs. I'm an amateur myself. I'll have an amateur cameraman. Well, this young boy was about 21, 22. But we believed in certain things, a certain approach to photography. If you want to be economical, you have to be disciplined. You have to pre-plan to a considerable extent. And so everything is very carefully planned in my films. My shooting ratio, incidentally, is four to one. It's been that all the way through. There are certain things that are dictated by circumstances. For instance, when one makes a film about contemporary Calcutta, one would, one should, ideally, shoot on location in actual interiors. Shooting on location in a city, urban location, can be hell, absolutely. I have had this experience many, many times. But streets, we cannot build in the studio. So we have willy-nilly to shoot in the streets, no matter how many thousands of people gather to watch and get in the way of your work. Nobody would put up any money. And they said, you can't shoot film. Uh, Why did they say that? Well, they said that you can't shoot on location. You have to be shooting in the studio. You have to have the lights under your control. I mean, the sun is very undependable, and you can't shoot in the rainy season. And you can't do this, you can't do that. You I can't mean, work with amateurs. You can't. All sorts of, you know, don'ts and uh, can'ts and all sorts of things. But then what I did was that I borrowed a 16 millimeter camera. And I took some footage myself under the worst possible light conditions, shooting early, before sunrise, after sunset, in pouring rain. And it all came out. But by October, I think it'll be much better because we won't have these passing clouds. Both of us were great admirers of Cartier Bresson, and we believed in available light. And we aimed at simulating available light in the studio by using bounce lights. With the second film, when we had to shoot interiors in the studio, supposedly houses in Benares, where there was a central courtyard with no roof on top, and the light all came from the sky. <laughs> and it was a kind of top lighting that we started using bounce lighting with cloths stretched over, and the lights bounced back from that except for night scenes where there is a source of light established and you, you follow that source as much as possible. If it's candle, if it's lantern, if it's electric light, you follow the source. It simplifies things, you know. I think about seven or eight years after that, I read an article in the American Cinematographer by Sven Nickvist. This was at the time of Through a Glass Darkly, I think, saying that they had invented bounce lighting. <laughs> uh, sorry, but we've been doing it since ever since, since 1953, 54. One thing I believe in is that a certain mood can be enhanced by certain states of nature, which again dictate certain qualities of lighting. For instance, the latter part of Bhatti Panchali was shot in the rainy season in very bleak kind of weather and it affects you. I think it affected the unit, it affected the actors, and it helped their acting, the performance, because they were unified with the natural setting, with the, with the mood of lighting, etc. And also in Aparajito, I think the latter part of the film, were all shot on cloudy days, with no sunlight at all, very gray, monochromatic, very gray. One uses uh, different methods with different actors never a set method with any actor. I've kept it sort of flexible. I get to know the person, and then I use a certain method which I think will work best in terms of that particular actor. Ever since my first film, I've used uh, both professionals and non-professionals, and also people who'd never face the camera or never even thought of facing the camera. When I write my scenario, each character I can sort of visualize and I look for people, for faces, which conform to my visual conception of an actor. And if I find a professional who fits the part, I take a professional. If not, then I start looking around for amateur actors or non-actors, even people just whom I meet on a tram or a bus on the street. There's a belief that all children are natural actors. 
which they're not. I had great trouble with the boy in Bhatir Machali. He was very shy, and I had to use all my patience, my persuasion. I treat them as adults. I, I sort of take them into my confidence and whisper instructions to them. And I find that after maybe the first day or the second day onwards, they're, they're very obedient, and they do what I ask them to do. He gives you entire liberty to perform in the beginning. Only He interferes only when you make a mistake or he wants to guide you or correct you in some direction. You just describe the particular scene or the emotion he wants, to, wants me to do. And just stand by and see how I can do it. So I also felt that I was contributing to the creation, to, to, to his creative uh, effort. Our lifestyle is a mixture now. So if you use purely classical Indian music in films which are, for instance, contemporary in theme and look urban contemporary, it's wrong, it doesn't sound right. So I have almost always combined Western and Indian styles, except if it's a story about rural India, which retains its age-old look. There you would use Indian folk instruments, things like that. This is a piece of music uh, from my film Charulata, which has a Scotch ballad as the basis of the tune. This comes back several times in the film, and I use Western instruments mainly in combination with Indian drums. And this is a common device which I often use in this film since it had a very sophisticated Westernized setting. It needed that. never written any music which can be clearly identified as either folk or classical or Indian or Western because the films have a look generally which are not wholly Indian even if it's a modern story laid in Calcutta there are all sorts of things which have very Western uh, connotations it's so Western that you have to devise a kind of a, uh, a combination thing you see it's, can't be either wholly India or wholly Western, so it's, it's music. In my very early films, I worked with other composers like Ravi Shankar, but they were not film composers really, they were virtuosos. And when I would tell them that I want a music which lasts 17 seconds, they would throw up their hand and say, no, we will play for three minutes, you choose what you like. So all the work was done in the editing room. And sometimes I would find that I didn't have the right kind of music for a certain episode. The composer hadn't provided the music. In any case, they don't like to be dictated too much. And they were all good friends on a personal level, so I didn't want to jeopardize the friendship. So I finally decided, since I couldn't find another composer to do the kind of thing that I wanted, I decided to teach myself. Yeah, I'm used to a tremendous lot of freedom right from my first film. And that's the main thing that worries me whether I'll be able to get the freedom that I want to the extent that I have it here now. Everything is decided beforehand. With a color film, all the color schemes, every piece of costume, I go out myself to buy the material. These are drawings of costumes which uh, the various characters in this film, Charulata, wore in the film, and I have uh, indicated the particular sets and the sequences in which uh, they were used. I design posters for my films, do some of the advertising campaign, 
occasionally designed the leaflets and have also designed the credits. And when I started making films, I almost uh, inevitably wrote my script in the visual form, as you find here. You see, the, these are scenes. It's a shooting script, actually, but they're not typed. They're in little drawings with notes about the dialogue on the side. And uh, there are also architectural things and uh, in discussions with art directors. I find that this form helps in my discussion with the cameraman as well as uh, it helps me because I always have a kind of a visual reference of the scene I'm going to shoot. In the early days, for instance, in the, at the time of the trilogy, I was doing the screenplay. I was uh, directing, of course. I didn't operate the camera at that time and I didn't write the music. At the time of editing also, I was there, very much there. But later on, for instance, I took over operating. I operate my own camera now. I've been doing so for the last 15 years. Not that I have no trust in my cameraman's operational abilities, but uh, I feel that uh, ever since we've been using an iReflex, that is the best position to judge the, the acting from, is through the lens. And also, I notice that working with non-professionals, they are happier if they don't see my face while I'm directing. <laughs> I'm not sort of staring at them like that, and, you know. So they are happier, they feel more relaxed. I can call my films my own without any qualms. I mean, uh, whatever is good or whatever is bad in my films is due to me. I mean, praise or blame. It, I, I feel much happier that way. This year, the Academy Board of Governors has voted to award an honorary Oscar to the great Indian filmmaker Satyajit Rai. An extraordinary experience for me to be here tonight to receive this magnificent award, certainly the best achievement of my movie-making career. Thank you very, very much. There has been an element of risk in almost everything I have done, because I was trying out something new, something which the audience had not seen before. Filmmaking has never been easy. To get a film done, one stops thinking of whether there's a school of filmmaking, whether you're creating a school, whether others following in your footsteps. You just keep on working, because after all, it's also a living. You make a living and you express yourself at the same time, crossing many obstacles on the way. I make the kind of films that I want to make. That's all I can do.